let's uh, kick things off. So um, this is a discussion about all the different technologies and why you might want to use them that basically <coughs> occur between the web server itself um, running things like, say, PHP and delivering static files and end user devices that are actually loading the content. Um, we're we're going to be talking about the technologies, what they can deliver, what's on the horizon, uh, why you should care about these things, and where the thresholds are psychologically in terms of human experiences and search indexing for what milestones are important to achieve in terms of performance to know whether you're doing well enough. A lot of this content will be an update from the previous year in terms of um, technologies like HTTP 3 all the way through what mobile networks are looking like in terms of what actual experiences people are having in terms of the bandwidth that they have practically loading websites. And I'm front loading all the new stuff so that if you've seen stuff before then you don't have to stay around for everything else. So um, I uh, have a few hats um, that I'm kind of including in here. Um, I'm uh, the CTO and co-founder at Pantheon, um, which is a platform for building and testing and deploying Drupal projects. Um, I uh, recently joined AMP's Technical Steering Committee, which is the new governance for that project. Uh, so I'm, I'm working on some of that technology now. And I'm also on Drupal's security team, which is not so much the performance side of things here as much as getting things right without actually undermining your security as well. So um, I talked a lot about Quick the previous years, um, and um, Quick is dead. Uh, it's getting replaced. I'll get into that in a moment, but I wrote a limerick for it. Um, there once was a spec named Quick whose packets went unchecked when sent, but with new TLS, implementation was a mess, and so HTTP 3 got it next. Um, so um, to avoid confusion about all the different protocols and the combinations that they could get deployed in, everything is getting rolled up into HTTP 3. Uh, it basically encompasses HTTP 2, quick as in the UDP transport, transport for that protocol, as well as the TLS 1.3 underlying requirement. Um, not everything needs requires TLS 1.3 in, in the sense of um, every connection in HTTP 3, but that's uh, this is sort of the bundle of technologies that are intended here. And this means that you're not going to, this avoids situations where you have, say, Quick with HTTP 1.1 or HTTP 2 without Quick or or Quick without um, uh, like TLS 1.3. And um, not all of those were actually existent combinations that would work. So it's all getting rolled up. If there's no final standard or implementation yet. Um, I expect that HTTP 2 will go away in the long term in the sense that HTTP 3, if you're optimizing a connection, is just basically going to be superior in almost every way. And uh, But I think that a lot of applications will continue to support 1.1, at least for th use within data centers and over high bandwidth links. The, um, the other thing that is on the horizon and in, in deployment in some cases is um, a... Uh, zero round trip um, technology for uh, negotiating um, secure connections. The idea with this is that historically, um, you can see in the middle example here, you would have a whole bunch of bounces before you would actually have an established connection for being able to make an HTTP request. This, this includes <coughs> um, a lot of different ones that I'll go into later in the presentation because this stuff is not new, but um, in short, um, there's a lot of promise around the idea of being able to just simply have a device, type in a URL, and be able to uh, handle everything in that first connection up to the server um, in terms of negotiating the security, sending the request, uh, and establishing the sort of session for it, uh, its communication. This isn't a panacea. Uh, there are definitely limitations around the deployment for this. Um, but um, TLS 1.3 has finally been standardized in the last year um, as RFC 8446. Um, and it has sort of two forms that um, are worth understanding. Um, the basic form of TLS 1.3, <clears throat> um, and how many people in here have already upgraded their stuff to use TLS 1.2 as a requirement? 
Okay, if, if you don't have your hands up, like that's something you should look into because there are vulnerabilities in previous versions of TLS and there are also performance benefits to getting on modern versions of this stuff too. Um, and I will go into all the details of that um, also in the second part of the presentation. But the uh, 1.3 is largely a housekeeping effort of 1.2. It gets rid of all the insecure algorithms. It requires every implementation to have some good ones uh, for ciphers. Um, and it supports the zero round trip um, technology <clears throat> as well as formalizing some practices that were widespread with one uh, with 1.2 but not officially part of the spec like, uh, like false start um, a number of CDNs are implementing zero round trip but um, there are actually some security risks to it uh, so it's we're sort of in this phase where this is mostly just a cleanup effort. So you don't necessarily stand to get a ton of performance benefit by deploying 1.3. <clears throat> um, another thing that's happening a lot more in the past year is edge side coding at CDNs. Um, this is um, the idea that instead of just deploying serverless functions on things like Lambda or Google Cloud functions, this actually deploys the code in all the pops around the world so that the so when a request comes in and hits the local pup, it's able to run some of the functionality for uh, the experience for the users right there without having to even go back to an origin. Uh, the biggest, most widespread deployment of this is probably with Cloudflare workers, which show some really excellent results around latency. Uh, and um, AWS has launched a product called Lambda at Edge, which allows you to deploy Lambda functions in a way that's also deployed in a widespread way across the globe. And Fastly has an experimental uh, implementation of the sort of WebAssembly container for running this stuff. WebAssembly is the underlying technology that Cloudflare and AWS are using as well for this. And as you can see on the right, um, not all the, this, uh, the ones are made equally in terms of, <coughs> in terms of their response times. Um, but um, they're all pretty great compared to going back to the origin and bootstrapping Drupal um, because this response time is pretty all-inclusive from getting the request in to uh, actually doing the dynamic stuff and um, getting the response out. I expect to see a lot of um, decoupled and headless implementations move to the edge with this sort of thing um, because a lot of these technologies support deploying in things like Node. And so you can actually deploy the stuff that's processing and rendering the page and customizing it for users in pops. So no matter where they're visiting it in the, use, in the world, uh, it gets a little bit customized uh, without a lot of penalty. Um, another thing that's happening, um, and this is not launched yet, but is in pretty late stage, is a technology called web packaging. Uh, the um, this is partly to answer for some of the side effects of other things that have been good things in general, but have hurt the experiences for some users. The uh, uh, HTTPS everywhere is great uh, in terms of user privacy and security, but it also really hurts performance when people use things like satellite connections in uh, a rural or developing parts of the world, because historically, a lot of the operators of these internet services have run local caches. And the when you encrypt with HTTPS, you can't actually use a local cache run by your ISP <clears throat> or your office. So uh, that's been a harm for people who are not in, uh, have the, who don't have great uh, connectivity. And also um, we have things like AMP URLs that are super annoying in the sense where you have a URL that's something like ampcache.google.com slash stuff that has the real kind of path to the site after it. And that um, that's not great for sharing content. Um, and even though it accelerates the delivery of the content, it's not a familiar URL to users. So we're working on things with web packaging um, to be able to bundle and sign content in a way where um, it basically puts it together in one file uh, that is able to get loaded into the browser. And that's not particularly new. That's basically how AMP works today. But uh, the new thing is, is that it's going to be able to be signed and then show the original URL of the site, even though it can get cached in various places like an internet service provider's cache or, uh, a, um, or something like um, an office uh, might be able to cache the content as well. 
It's gotten some mixed receptions, so I'm not sure how standardized this is actually going to get, so I can't really predict that it's going to get fully ratified, but I do expect that it will at least be the foundation for being able to deliver AMP pages with the original URL of a site and not have it look weird on, in the end user's browser. <clears throat> um, another thing that's happening is um, uh, increasingly um, it's possible to use technologies like AMP to actually be the primary technology for a site rather than a second publishing path. Like the standard way that most people have used it as publishers so far has been they have a normal page for the site and then they'll set up a second page that is a um, is sort of the AMP compliant version of the page and that one is uh, has historically been kind of more limited, simple, and a second publishing path. But now that there are far more monetization options in AMP and um, more flexible features for doing layout and dynamic interaction, there are sites that are actually launching now and just choosing to deliver all of their pages as AMP compliant. Um, and this offers a number of benefits in the sense that it, um, it means that you don't have to have two different publishing paths uh, that to, to do testing on uh, and maintain. Um, but actually a lot of the stuff on AMP is great for even normal users on normal browsers. Even if you don't have an AMP compliant client, it, AMP is actually just a subset of HTML5. So it actually loads really, really fast on regular desktop browsers too if you load those pages. So it's, um, uh, it's a kind of a neat option to look at if you're, if you're considering adding AMP to a site, consider maybe even switching over the main version of the page to, to something like that. Um, we're also, like, at least internally in AMP, we're also looking at um, making AMP components available for non-AMP pages so that there's a little bit more of a gradual path in terms of being able to implement some of these things. Um, and I, I kind of expect that a lot of the optimizations that AMP has may find their way into frameworks and content management systems over the next year. Like there are things like CSS tree shaking where it, it analyzes the tree of CSS, um, removes all the parts that aren't actually used on that page, and then delivers CSS that's not just aggregated like Drupal does, but also pruned against anything that's unnecessary. And that makes it a smaller page load, um, faster rendering and parsing time in the client browser. Um, it especially helps mobile devices, but it helps desktop too. Um, uh, another thing we're seeing um, is that we're starting to see progressive web app technologies used uh, for reasons other than delivering an actual app. Um, because uh, it allows you to do things like isolate some of your JavaScript and um, operations in web and service workers from the actual main pages, uh, which can reduce the amount of uh, interruption to things like scrolling up and down the page uh, and um, doing the initial paints and page loads. But one of the biggest popular things is to make it more resilient for unreliable or slow connections so that you can have a fallback where if you can't load something because it got interrupted or it's not loading fast enough, it allows you to implement a sort of um, second, uh, like an alternative handler for it that operates with those connections. Um, it's also showing great performance results. Like um, a lot of major apps have rebuilt their um, regular mobile sites using PWA, and they're seeing drops in load time for interactivity that are going down like 60%. Um, so if you care not just about painting content, but making the page interactive, um, uh, some of these techniques are worth looking at, even if you don't actually care about having someone, say, pin the app to the home screen. Um, but I will uh, provide one piece of caution because I've seen this in working with some sites that uh, I've done some consulting on, uh, where when you start implementing things like web and service workers, it can have weird effects if you do things like running multiple sites off the same domain, which we call, like at least internally at Pantheon, domain masking. Where let's say you have example.com and example.com slash store and example.com slash blog. If they all go to different applications, it's possible for them to interfere with each other if you deploy PWA in, uh, in a way that isn't completely careful. Um, because one site can register itself as a, sort of a handler that can start interfering with the other ones. <clears throat> 
Uh, Brotley is like slowly expanding. Um, Brotley is a compression method that um, allows packing um, content together with like with a sh what's called like a shared dictionary, which means that rather than having each piece of content have its own independent compression, Brotley has uh, a concept of a shared dictionary so that different separate pieces of content, like multiple CSS files or multiple JavaScript files, uh, can um, can be compressed more efficiently. And it takes about the same amount of load on the client to, to extract it as the traditional gzip stuff. And it's now up to 86% of clients supporting it. Um, but the server and CDN support is kind of spotty. It's, usually, it's almost never on by default, at least in the case of web servers you can set up. But things like Apache and Nginx often have modules you can enable. I know that Nginx has a module that you can, you, in, uh, that you can enable to, uh, to use Brutley compression. Um, I expect it to especially increase as CDNs and web servers roll out support for HTTP 3 because they're going to have to rebuild their handlers anyway and they, they'll probably rebuild it on some of the latest technology. Um, and uh, so in mobile device stuff, um, it continues to be a pretty slow road of uh, improvements to mobile device connections, but a, but a steady one. Um, uh, Google had anticipated as late as the, the beginning of 2018 that we were going to be seeing like 3G-ish speeds on mobile devices through about 2020. Um, it turns out that I think that might be a little pessimistic. Uh, it um, looks like we're getting closer to 4G speeds in developed areas, but if you have any mix of users in, say, developing countries, they're going to have a wild mix of technologies. Like, in, for example, in India, um, there's basically been deployed like 2G technology traditionally, and the things that are entering the market now in major urban cores are going right to 4 and 5G. So. Uh, users in places like India are either connecting at very slow speeds or very, very fast speeds. And uh, it's, it can be challenging to develop things that meet the experiences for both, but if you need to, to meet those experiences, uh, I'd recommend like shooting for the, the bottom of the line because that still provides a great experience for the high-end users. So um, uh, I figured I would throw in like a little gap in here if there are any questions about like what's new, in especially if anyone wants to head off because they're familiar with the rest of like the background of performance and how why these technologies are important and what thresholds to deploy them at. Yes. It's not really a technical question. Just something I saw on the news about five G. I guess there was complaints over like the power level that's emitted by five G. In terms of um, like the like health effects. I can't really speak to that. Yeah. Um, I mean, what what I I mean, at least my familiarity with a lot of the studies is that uh, a lot of the uh, frequencies are too high frequency to penetrate any substantial level into the skin, mm -hmm. in the sense that like even in the worst possible case, with um, say you you have a weak connection and your device is putting out a lot of power relative to what it can do, I've heard that it can maybe heat up the surface of your skin at negligible amount, mm -hmm. uh, but I, that's my understanding, but I'm not a doctor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, I saw 5G, that's the first thing I thought about. Uh, okay, I'll just keep going. So um, I think one of the important things when looking at performance is to think about the business case for it. In terms of, um, if you're talking to clients or you're talking to um, a kind of pro uh, project owner, uh, for something, how do you justify spending money and time working on performance and security? So, um, delivering HTTPS is pretty essential at this point. Um, the uh, it's essential for many reasons. Um, browsers are starting to warn users more and more about it. Chrome will literally say a page is not secure if it doesn't have HTTPS. Right now, it does it um, in a not secure indicator that's gray. <coughs> but it's going to be moving to this sort of red indicator that they're planning on. And they're actually planning on completely dropping the lock. Um, uh, the Chrome team recently um, uh, decided that security was going to be, be treated as the standard expectation and insecurity is going to be treated as a warning. So 
Um, I would expect that the lock is going, going away. Um, that's actually been an, um, an, an announced change for Chrome. Uh, but if you don't have um, HTTPS set up, then you're going to be punished for it. Uh, in the sense that uh, search engine ranking, um, in terms of uh, subjective user experience, um, and also in terms of the features and performance you get on your site, because there are a lot of things that are locked behind HTTPS only. Like all that progressive web app stuff I mentioned is only possible to do if you're delivering it over HTTPS. Uh, but the reason why I go into why it's so important to deliver is not just because it's a gatekeeper to other technologies, but because it can be challenging to deliver uh, in a way that's very performant. Um, because it looks like time page rank uses time to first byte. Um, uh, the this is this is a little old this uh, um, one and Google has moved to a different metric that I'll talk about in a moment for mobile search results. But there still seems to be a really good correlation between time to first byte and the deliver uh, and the ranking of a site. Um, this is the idea of when say the Google bot is visiting the site, it will issue the request, it will negotiate HTTPS uh, if the site has it. And it will basically be running a stopwatch from when it's sent off the request to when it gets the first byte of HTML back. The, uh, it actually punishes you pretty quickly. Like You can notice that the search rank position, all other things being equal, falls really, really rapidly with even a few hundred milliseconds. So I typically say that you want to shoot for um, a 500 millisecond or less threshold, sometimes even 400 milliseconds or less if you want to be ambitious. Um, but um, this was new for last year, uh, but mobile search is now using overall performance in terms of the actual painting of the page. And Google uses a metric for this that they call time to first um, meaningful paint. And you can see this in a tool that Google has called Lighthouse uh, that's available in Chrome. It's also available as a service. And what this means in terms of meaningful paint is it doesn't mean that the browser has just simply started what it considers the paint operation. Google's actually looking for what is the point at which the browser paints the main content of the page. And um, I haven't actually looked at the underlying algorithm, but what it seems to do is it renders the whole page, looks at what the final page looks like, like and it looks for the first point in time that the page actually starts to look like the final page. In the sense uh, that if you have a news article, um, actually showing the, the text to read for a user is considered part of the meaningful paint. And Google will not stop the clock until you render that. This means that doing things like prioritizing advertising uh, before your content will punish you in the search results. Uh, the, but it, it, all of these things ultimately rely on the overall performance of the site in the sense that um, the clock for meaningful paint of load, loading the content, of course, is going to wait until it gets the first byte. Um, I'll go into like how these all stack up um, a little later. Um, and, and then if this is not like news to anyone who does SEO, but like losing ranking in your search results is absolutely devastating to getting click through rates. <laughs> um, the psychological side's interesting as well um, for users and their patience. Users start getting really impatient around um, two to two, two and a half seconds on a page load. The, uh, and I, I sometimes call this the silent top of the funnel, these two things, the click through uh, from the search results and impatience overloading the page because if someone doesn't wait for the page to load and you have your analytics set up properly to be loaded at the end of the page load, then you're not actually going to see this user at all. Like they, they won't necessarily appear in your analytics at all. They, you, you won't even know that, they're, that you're losing their attention. Um, users typically start dropping off rapidly around the, um, uh, the like t that two-ish second threshold. Um, but what's interesting about this is how rapidly they drop off. Uh, like it goes from a conversion rate of almost 2% uh, on a typical site to losing um, a quarter of that by adding um, just under another second to the page load. And it drops to basically half uh, if you go to like four seconds. Um, Google has uh, corroborated these in its own research as well. Um, it says 2017 here uh, from the source, but this study was actually published in 2018 um, around, I think, February. 
Um, uh, so I only was able to get it into the deck this year. But uh, they found that the increase in time from the one to three seconds drops your conversion rate by a third. Uh, well, any bounces obviously can't turn into conversions. Uh, and bounces for users are unfortunately common. Um, mo a typical mobile site actually takes sometimes five to 15 seconds to load. It's actually pretty awful. Uh, there's an amazing amount of um, bounces occurring and conversion rate loss happening on mobile sites right now because of performance issues. Um, so if you start looking at this, um, this is sort of what I call the silent top of the funnel up here, is that you have to have the user click the search result um, because they have to see it and has to be ranked highly. Um, and then they have to wait for the page to load. And then they actually start uh, getting tracked in the analytics system as the traditional funnel in terms of understanding that they're seeing the page, maybe where they're scrolling, what they're clicking. Um, and so I'm, I'm not this user converts section is sort of more the standard part of the funnel, but if you lose the user in these top two parts, then they're gone. Um, so uh, I typically use these as measures for success. Uh, like, of course the site needs to do what it needs to do. Um, the reason why I add that as a requirement here is, of course it's easy to get performance if you just neglect what the site actually needs to accomplish. I've sometimes seen cases where a site will add something like AMP pages, but not actually add ads to them or monetize them. And that doesn't actually meet the business value, even if it delivers great performance, because you're then sending users to pages that aren't monetized. Uh, so um, it's always important to keep that in mind. But um, I typically have these as the two thresholds, the time to first bite being under 500 milliseconds, and the time to first paint or meaningful paint being under 2.4. Um, and of course, reliability of the site's important too, because if it's offline, then the page time is page load time is infinite. Uh, but don't create an unnecessary work for yourself. If you're hitting these goals, then you don't necessarily need to keep going down the optimization rabbit hole, because there are always more improvements you can make, but you've got to stop at some point. So I typically make this as the business value case. So uh, I mentioned earlier that HTTPS is really, really important, but it doesn't necessarily um, map, match with some of the performance goals in, a, in an easy way because traditionally HTTPS has added additional round trips, additional negotiation time, um, and there's um, a kind of cheeky site on the internet called like is, is uh, I think TLS or HTTPS fast enough.com and it just says like yes and then gives you all the case on it. But it's mostly talking about the, the time computing on each side and not talking about the round trips that are having to happen between the client and the um, and the uh, server side. So um, I say yes, but also no in the sense that it is fast, but if it's, it's fast if it's deployed properly. Um, the path to the first byte um, is importantly, importantly, the number of round trips you take times the round trip time that it Let's say that you're going shopping to pick up stuff. Um, even if you're going to the corner store, if you have to take 10 trips to the corner store from your apartment, that's not actually that efficient. Uh, it might actually be more efficient for you to take one trip to a local grocery store than 10 trips to a corner store. So these both matter. Um, the, um, a lot of these things are getting solved. Um, the, but you also have to deploy modern software as well. Um, there's some CPU overhead for negotiation. Um, that can be optimized on mobile devices by going with um, certificates and TLS that uses um, like the um, ECDSA curves. Um, the, it actually makes a lot of difference in terms of the performance, what type of certificate and ciphers are used. Uh, the traditional approach of using RSA is really secure, and I tend to really like it for that reason because I don't think that there's um, a lot of risk to it. But uh, when it comes to um, extracting all the performance you can out of a device, you probably want to look at things like using some of the uh, elliptic curve stuff because it runs sometimes a hundred or a thousand times as fast on something like a mobile device. And that doesn't matter that much on a desktop processor, but on a mobile processor it often does. And as fast as our mobile processors are getting, they often are running in a throttled mode to manage um, thermal performance and battery battery life. So 
even the fact that our devices are getting really, really fast doesn't change the fact that, that uh, overhead matters. Um, the active connection CPU overhead is sort of once everything is negotiated, how much time does the CPU spend encrypting and decrypting stuff? With modern um, uh, AES ciphers and modern processors that have acceleration for that, it's basically negligible and not something you have to worry about that much. Uh, it used to be that um, we had all these additional round trips as well. Um, we used to have, uh, for regular old HTTP 1.1, um, like the, the um, TCP round trip to do the handshake, um, a round trip uh, for, um, uh, for making the request. Um, the second uh, thing on here in terms of to resume is that um, his, uh, you often didn't have. You could often leave out one of the round trips if it was um, already had already been talking up with the server, um, and um, uh, and then you also have the, T, uh, the TLS handshake stuff um, that historically has occurred. But we've sort of scrapped a lot of that. Um, HTTP three is going to the in going to UDP to end the um, initial handshake. Um, uh, TLS uh, 1.2 with false start is optimizing a lot of the other handshake stuff. So really what we have is at least one round trip versus HTTP um, in terms of uh, at least in most cases you need um, some sort of encryption session uh, instantiation. This is conditionally not necessar necessary um, for cases I'll get into, but um, I'd like to compare how much the, the different types of software you deploy in a server affects this. So let's say you deploy an old stack. Let's say you have a CentOS 6 machine or something like that, and you just do uh, like yum install the stuff for the LAMP stack and set up a site. Um, a typical connection from a browser to load a page from that server is gonna take at least eight round trips. Um, it's going to have um, one round trip for the TCP, two round trips for the TLS, because it'll be a, a traditional kind of old TLS model, um, uh, one round trip for the HTTP, and then it'll establish a whole bunch of other connections in parallel in order to download the rest of the content. Typically, a browser does six concurrent connections. Um, there's the one initial one plus the five additional ones it sets up. And then it tries to spread loading things like images, CSS, JavaScript, et cetera, over those additional connections. Let's say you do a modern stack. Um, this is something like a, a well-tuned Nginx on a modern version of something like CentOS 7, maybe even slightly newer than that, um, maybe like Ubuntu, the current Ubuntu LTS. Uh, you can get it down to three round trips um, because you have, um, you still have the TCP because this is not HTTP 3 yet because it doesn't exist yet, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, you have the one round trip for TLS, one round trip for TCP, um, and um, you only have the initial connection. Um, so um, that's not actually really as much of a plus one as much as just the, the one that exists. So you really have three round trips to be able to um, get everything in place to be able to um, suck down the data for that site. Um, uh, we have some opportunities for the future stack uh, that I like to go over. And this is like, this is sort of what I anticipate in the next like 12 to 24 months that we're seeing. Um, with HTTP 3 and a GET request, um, it's possible to get all of this happening in one round trip uh, because it doesn't need to do a handshake. With, TL with TLS 1.3, zero round trip time, or uh, I think that's what it's, or zero round, I forget what the RTT exactly stands for, but it, it stands for the idea of it taking an additional round trip for TLS, um, but it basically, um, embeds the TLS setup into the initial request with HTTP, and then it gets a response back. This is incredibly fast, especially, and this is an incredible optimization, especially if there's a long distance or a high amount of latency between the end user and that server. The reason why I separate it for GET and non-GET is there is one security risk uh, to this zero RTT technology, which is that it has it's vulnerable to something called a replay attack. Uh, it means that when you set up the connection, it's possible for someone to capture data from it even without um, access to your computer or the server uh, as a man in the middle attack um, uh, and then replay that against the server and, and repeat the request. So this is safe as long as the request is something that doesn't change anything on the server. It'll 
certainly show up in the server logs that it gets <clears throat> multiple requests, but they don't actually get to see the data for the request or the response, so it's still private. Um, but this is why some um, CDNs like Cloudflare only do zero RTT for GET requests. Um, in the case of a non-GET request, you can't quite use the zero RTT stuff, so you have one round trip for TLS handshake and one round trip for everything else, but you're still down to two. It's still a massive improvement versus um, the like traditional stack of five or ten years ago. So um, this is all about reducing round trips here, um, but I want to also talk about how we can make the trip uh, take less time. Um, this is why I like to add in kind of a CDN model to this, because while taking 10 trips to the corner store may be worse than taking 10, 10 tri uh, one trip to a grocery store, um, taking one trip to the corner store or two trips to the corner store is still better. So you, if we can pull things closer to the client, then the round trips themselves take less time too. So we're sort of fighting both things here. We're, we're cutting down the number of round trips and then we're cutting down the round trip time. Um, and so, um, by, CDNs work on a model called POPs, where they have a point of presence that allows the client to talk to the POP. A lot of people think about CDNs mostly in terms of the caching they provide, where um, you can cache the content so that it doesn't have to go back to the origin server. But there's another really important thing that these CDNs provide, especially for uh, reducing the uh, round, round trip overall burdens, which is that they actually use a persistent connection, usually back to the origin or deeper in their systems. What this means is that the client, for all of the round trips, even for a page that's not cached, it will still load faster over a CDN than it would load if you didn't have a CDN. So a CDN is still really important to have, even for your dynamic pages and your dynamic content. So um, let's throw some actual numbers into this to see like what sort of results we get uh, with different sorts of setups, stacks, and kind of numbers in terms of like, I want to bring this back to that idea of um, how do we hit that um, uh, 500 millisecond first byte? How do we hit that 2.4 second uh, first paint? So um, I had that assumption that like Drupal renders the page in 200 milliseconds. That's probably optimistic, <laughs> but um, we do see a lot of sites on our platform that do it in 150 to 200 milliseconds. So I didn't want to be too pessimistic because I think the results are very clear even if we don't have Drupal take a long time rendering the stuff. So um, an old stack and no CDN um, has a, a time to first byte under um, best possible cases with like, um, I think this is with, um, yeah, with like varnish in the, uh, in the mix. Um, the, so let's say you have like varnish in front of your stuff caching, um, caching it. Um, the, you're looking at 360 milliseconds or so under pretty good circumstances. Like these, these numbers are actually based on like my home internet connection um, to like Google or something like that. Um, in terms of these TCP, TLS, and other round trip times. Like, you can basically get the round trip time for one round trip by just pinging something. Um, so let's say it's 45 milliseconds. You have the one round trip for TCP, two round trips for TLS with the old stack, one round trip for HTTP, and um, you also have a, a extra connections being set up, those five extra ones, in order to basically pull down the other content. You're at really a time to first byte in terms of the browser having everything set up to really download the site of almost 360 milliseconds by this point. Um, you've almost blown the budget before we even really started. Um, and let's say we miss a page cache. Um, the 45 milliseconds is assuming um, an additional round trip um, possibly um, uh, to, to account for other kind of network and overhead. But you could also assume that you know, Drupal is probably going to take more time than that anyway to load the page. So um, if you miss the page cache in, say, Drupal or Varnish, you actually completely blow the budget. Uh, so we're already worse than our, our goal time to first byte under pretty um, typical circumstances here uh, with an old stack. Um, with a modern stack and a CDN, um, the situation is so much better. Uh, because uh, 
45 milliseconds actually is not my time to Google it. And now that I'm thinking about it, that, this is like time to get it like half across the country. So this is like Chicago to San Francisco. So a modern stack with a CDN has a pop in basically the neighborhood. So the time to do the round trip for T TCP is gonna be much, much shorter. Uh, this is, I think, my office to like Fastly or something like that. Um, TLS round trip is going to be one, uh, one, only one round trip and it's going to be really fast. And HTTP is only gonna be one round trip and it's going to be really, really fast. And because we're talking about HTTP2 here, you don't have to set up all those additional connections. So you actually have a time to first byte that is like getting vanishingly small. Uh, this is pretty ideal. Um, of course, um, your circumstances are gonna be much worse than this on something like a mobile connection. But the point is to get headroom for these things. Like this is buying you extra time uh, to have not everything go perfectly. And then you miss the page cache. Um, you know, that's, that adds the time that Drupal takes for the page. But we're actually comfortably under our time to first byte even with Drupal uh, loading it. Even if Drupal takes three or 400 milliseconds, we're still comfortably under our uh, time to first byte for the page load. Or for the time to for, uh, for the um, the way that that uh, like starting off that race, um, the situation gets much much more severe when you start working with longer distances. So, if you cross the Atlantic, um, you basically are going to blow your budget from the start uh, if you don't have a CDN in place. Um, there's no real getting around it. Um, if you have a modern stack, uh, you'll be able to make your budget. <laughs> Let's say uh, you're going from um, Asia Pacific to North America. This is, I think, from like Singapore or something like that, or Japan. Um, uh, it's just <clears throat> impossible to even get a good user experience if you don't have uh, a modern stack and CDN in front of the site if someone's loading the page from that kind of distance. Um, just add in a CDN and have a modern stack. Um, the modern stack actually comes with the, C the CDN in many cases as well because a CDN will often add things like HTTP2 and modern TLS, even if your server doesn't have it. And you can actually have a pretty decent experience, even with missing the page cache and routing it all the way back to uh, across the Pacific. So if our goal is to get under 500 milliseconds, the only way to consistently do that is to add in something like a CDN. Uh, you can get away with it if you can run your site um, from the same continent as your users and you can run a modern stack. But if, if that's not something that you, uh, if that's not a restriction that applies to your site, then um, a CDN is basically required. Um, the time to first paint, um, the race starts with the time to first byte. But then we start loading all the files and have the CPU time for it. And um, since time to first byte is sort of the firing the gun of like the browser being able to actually render things, um, uh, it can have some pretty severe impacts in terms of um, someone being able to view the site in terms of their experience, depending on how you deploy something like a CDN. So if you don't deploy a CDN and you have a typical weight for a page of like one to 10 megabytes, uh, and it's having to do um, a whole bunch of round trips all the way to the origin for all these things, you can very quickly get into what we're seeing as typical load times for for something like a, uh, a mobile site uh, without any real optimization. It's, e it's easy to see how over a non-ideal connection, this can easily skyrocket into 10 or 15 seconds for loading a page. Um, some people compromise and only use a CDN for just their assets. Like if you have S3 and you throw a, uh, something like CloudFront in front of it, or you only use something like Akamai for your assets, but you just have the, re the connection for the site go back to the servers, that definitely improves the situation, but it can't really buy a great experience for users. You really want to deploy a CDN in front of everything. Um, the, like, what doesn't, and it honestly doesn't even matter that much which CDN you choose. Um, Cloudflare, Fastly, CloudFront, Akamai, um, Edgecast, like there are a whole bunch of great ones out there, but uh, a full CDN in front of the site um, can really um, reduce the, um, the delays for users. Uh, and this is sort of how it shapes up as like um, the graphs, like this is the traditional case. This is where that time is occurring. You can see how um, the time to origin for getting the, the HTML response uh, plus um, all the critical resource downloads can, can push up your load time quite a bit. Um, and you can see how um, 
uh, by having those resources closer, cached, and delivered over modern protocols um, keeps winding that in. And you can actually even start thinking about really delighting users because um, even the 2.4 seconds is sort of a, a, an impatience measure, but if you can start pulling in the page load times below a second, then you actually delight users. And that actually starts creating some positive psychological associations with the site. Um, so we have some empirical results from deploying these technologies across Pantheon, um, both from our own results and uh, from some third parties. Um, so here's what we saw. Um, we switched last year um, and the year before, um, basically all the sites on the platform from having uh, Varnish and a modern stack in one location, which is sort of the middle case I was saying, to running everything behind a CDN. Um, this is uh, actually the median empirical results that we saw uh, for page load times um, from pulling them from Singapore, I think Frankfurt, and, um, uh, and uh, I think the Bay Area, like the West Coast. So, uh, maybe Oregon. Um, and you can see the pretty dramatic results that we got in terms of the improvement and how it doesn't degrade, the, the experience doesn't degrade for users very much even as distance increases as long as there's a CDN deployed. Here's more of the full results. We just basically sorted all of the um, individual samples that we took um, and um, turned it into a curve to show the distribution of the results. And uh, that previous uh, graph was just the median, so basically just a line down the middle of this one. Um, but you can see how we sort of blow the budgets if you don't have the CDN in front of it. Um, this came out um, uh, late last year. Um, this was a review that Review Signal did of WordPress hosting um, companies in terms of the stacks that they're using. Um, and you can actually see um, the difference that it makes. So in this top graph, the only one that's using a CDN um, is, is Pantheon. And we can basically credit almost all of that uh, stable performance to having a CDN in front of the platform. And then on the second graph, um, you can see two lines sort of overlapping each other. That's WordPress VIP and Pantheon, both of which use CDNs. Um, and I believe that Press Labs may use a CDN as well. But you can basically see all of the hosts that are using CDNs are sort of bunched toward the bottom in terms of consistent experiences for users over the globe. Um, so I have some uh, uh, updates on the like, advice for best practices for where I recommend kind of spending time and focus. Um, uh, these are traditional things that some people have done uh, for performance reasons, like separate domains for CDNs. No real reason to do that with HTTP2 these days because it can do as many concurrent requests as it wants to the same origin. The, reasons why, the reason why you might have split it out before is since browsers would do up to six connections to each origin, then by doing different origins, you could have it do 12 or more connections for your stuff and pull down more stuff at the same time. But that doesn't really help with HTTP2 anymore. Um, and that, that's sort of for those first two ones. And um, not having HTTPS historically helped your site a bit with performance because you didn't have all of those concerns that HTTPS created to solve properly. But deployed properly, HTTPS is really very performant. Uh, and since it unlocks additional performance features like HTTP2 <clears throat> and probably eventually HTTP3, as well as things like progressive web app features uh, and other features that can provide business value to the site in terms of things like geolocation and other device integrations, it actually is the case that a well-designed site on HTTPS is going to be faster than a site on HTTP now. Um, one second. Why is this not okay? Um, so um, these are the things that uh, I think are worth spending a lot of focus on. Um, performance testing on mobile. Uh, mobile is sort of the final frontier of performance in the sense that if you have a great mobile experience, everyone else is going to have a great experience. Desktop experience, tablet experience, etc. So testing on phones under that under those restrictive conditions of um, wireless networks and uh, limited CPU, et cetera, can really matter. And I don't just mean performance testing on mobile in the empirical sense of pulling out a phone. If you use things like webpagetest.org, you can actually set on there 
what sort of connection speed that you want and what device class you want. And Google's Lighthouse tool actually automatically does this by default. Like Google's Lighthouse always simulates it over a 3G style connection on, um, on a device um, class of like about three to four years old, um, just to be kind of inclusive with it. Um, compressing images effectively uh, can really help uh, minimize the amount of content going to the browser. WebP is a great format. WebP is actually finally available in Firefox. It just shipped. Uh, they, <laughs> um, I heard that they're, they had to like roll back that release for some, I, I'm not sure if it's the same release that had WebP, but it might be on hold for a reason unrelated to WebP. But uh, uh, in any case, like within a month or so, all Firefox users should have uh, WebP, at least if they have an updated version. Um, using appropriate resolutions matters too. There's no point in sending like 10K image down to uh, a device to show on a tiny screen um, if it can't actually make use of that. Um, uh, things like Drupal's um, image styles can really help with, with these things. Um, I'm not sure if it supports the WebP at this point, but uh, even modern formats like um, PNG can, can still be quite good as long as you use the right resolution. Um, I also uh, uh, urge you to cache for longer in your CDNs because uh, the, like, the, the days of, of having things like five minutes or 10 minutes for a page in the CDN uh, in, or, or page cache, uh, I think are a little past us at this point, um, especially since almost all these CDNs have APIs to do cache invalidation that you can wire into Drupal. That, so that when you change a page or change the site, it can actually flush the content out of the CDN rather than storing it only for short windows of time because the vast majority of sites for the vast majority of the time are not publishing brand new content all the time. So using longer cache lifetimes can, can help keep the content um, in all those pops around the world so that users get a great experience. If you are deploying your own server, I encourage you to look at a technology called BBR. It's called, um, it's, uh, it's a congestion control method for TCP. This will become much less important when uh, HTTP 3 is out because it doesn't use TCP. But the way that TCP works is that it does this handshake and it has to ensure that every packet gets, in, gets to the other side in order before sending the next stuff. So what it does with TCP congestion controls, it tries to figure out whether it's losing packets uh, and whether it should back off. But the problem with a lot of the traditional congestion control systems is that they back off way too aggressively. Like um, a mobile device will lose a few packets because maybe you're roaming or something like that, or maybe there's some interference, and the server will just go, whoa, I can't send that much content down. Clearly, you've, you've run out of bandwidth. I'm going to trickle it to you now. BBR is a much more effective method of not backing off so aggressively and being able to use the full bandwidth of the connection so that, uh, so that mobile, mobile users can have a much better experience. And finally, HTTP2 can provide some benefits. Um, I don't want to push it that hard because it's, uh, I don't think it, it's a panacea, um, but if you have a bunch of concurrent assets on the site that you don't have packed to get together, it can certainly provide some benefits. Like if you run, for example, if you ran a Drupal site without CSS and JavaScript aggregation, it helps a lot. Um, CSS, JavaScript, uh, CSS and JavaScript aggregation help more, uh, but in some cases, maybe you have a ton of images on the page. Maybe you have a ton of fonts um, that aren't packed together. And here are things that um, uh, to look at in terms of like, things going forward. Um, uh, I'm really hoping that we can eventually turn off aggregated CSS and JavaScript. Uh, I'm hoping that the point at which I'll be able to say that that's a recommendation is maybe when we have HTTP 3 and Broadleaf everywhere. But for now, it actually still makes a big benefit uh, based on the tests that we've done at Pantheon. Um, uh, and I also hope that we have to have less reliance on generated image variants in terms of um, how like CDNs and other things can handle dynamic negotiation with devices for adaptive stuff. But uh, again, I can't make that recommendation yet. Um, and I'm really looking forward to like HTTP 3 and smart things around like HTTP 2 push where it can only push down, where it, it, it can be smart about only pushing down the stuff that the device needs rather than everything all the time, which is the way it sort of works right now. And if, like, as uh, Broatly compression 
rolls out more, like I, I think that that uh, will um, minimize the amount of bandwidth, especially for sites that have a lot of disparate assets too. So with that, uh, I will open up to, I guess we have a couple minutes for questions. Yes. So uh, the last bit about generated image uh, variants. Mm -hmm. Y'all use Fastly to see the OTP, right? Mm -hmm. uh, do you, they've got an image optimization service that will crunch all these things so that the marketing department can upload an image this big, but Fastly will serve an image that's actually optimized. Do y'all use that? We have some clients that are using it. We offer it as a, something with a, what we call like advanced CDN, where we set up a separate um, service on Fastly for a site that is fully configurable for that site. And the reason why we do that is because it's not something that's automatic on Fastly. Yeah. Their image optimization service is more like, if you look at the way the URL patterns work, you have to basically send in like a query string of like, I want it in this format with these dimensions and these other properties. And what it will do is it will return an image that matches those properties derived from the source image at the origin. But it doesn't negotiate anything with the client. Okay, so, so it doesn't all happen automatically. Mm. Okay. Uh, so like even if we turned it on to the platform in general, it wouldn't benefit sites it unless they, like yeah. Uh, but one site on Pantheon that is using this <clears throat> is patch.com. They're using the image optimization service on Fastly. Other questions? Yes. I was reading about that there's sort of a plan to deprecate TLS one It's I, I consider it basically deprecated. Uh, if you have any compliance needs like PCI, it's it's kind of it's. I believe it's already uh, not an option. Um, so uh, I would retire them as soon as possible. The vast, vast majority of devices um, uh, support TLS 1.1 or 1.2 at this point. Um, in fact, on Pantheon's Edge, we don't support anything less than TLS 1.2 for anything. And that has not been a problem. It is often an option in CDN or server configuration what you're able to support. And there are usually documented configurations you can find online. Like, I would search for like, uh, so I don't love PCI, but like I think PCI has a very sensible um, balance between security and compatibility in terms of some of their standards. So if you're configuring a web server, I would probably search for something like um, PCI HTTPS Nginx or PCI T uh, HTTPS Apache or something like that. And there will be documented configurations that have compliant configurations that remove the bad uh, options and enforce the right things. And then the other thing I would do is throw the SSL labs test at the server, and that will also tell you any oversights or problems with compatibility or security of a configuration. Um, to get an A+, you also have to add HT HSTS as well, though. But you can get an A with, with just the right TLS configuration. It's another good reason to use a CDN. Like it actually means that your last mile uh, is usually using a very modern uh, TLS and HTTPS configuration, assuming you enable it, um, because that's the highest risk part of the connection is is from the user to the CDN. At least, like aside from like state sponsored attacks, like the biggest risk is from the user to the CDN. Client perspective, will that uh, will adding a CDN will reduce the number of servers provision for an application? Uh, sorry, can you say that again? From a client side, uh, if you are adding or using a CDN, will that help the customer to reduce the number of servers they provision? On a cloud? Oh, okay. So servers, in terms of the numbers, number you have to deploy at the origin. If you're already deploying something like Varnish in front of it, then I would not expect the CDN to hit much more often. But uh, if you don't have something like Varnish in front of it, then adding a CDN can help a lot. Uh, the, the, across the entire Pantheon platform for our CDN, we have a hit rate of 80% uh, on average, which means that every, of every 10 requests coming to Pantheon, eight of them get served in the CDN and don't have to hit the platform. So that means that we, we basically can deploy 
um, one fifth of the, of the number of servers that we would have to if we processed every single request. But we, we already had um, Varnish in front of it before then, so it didn't change that much when we moved from Varnish to a CDN. Because it, the primary overhead in terms of the number of servers is based on cache misses. Yes? So does Pantheon not have uh, Varnish at all anymore? We do not run, um, oops, we do not actually run our own instances of Varnish. Uh -huh. There are instances of Varnish <laughs> run for us by Fastly. Oh, okay. Um, and we also use a service from them called Origin Shield, which most CDNs have a similar option. The idea is that um, traditionally a CDN works in a way where you hit the pop, and then if you miss at the pop, then you go right to the origin. Origin Shield, um, and also like uh, I think like Cloudflare has like Argo routing, and Akamai has a similar thing. I forget what, forget what they call it. But what they do is they'll send it to if they miss at the local pop. It'll send the request to a pop that's near the origin, and then try to hit there, and then it will um, hit uh, the origin if it misses there. So it means that even if the local pop doesn't have a cached copy, if there is a cached copy anywhere in the world, there will usually be one at the origin shield, and it will hit that. And then what Fastly does is it hashes the requests in a way where it deterministically <coughs> sends them to a single server um, within the pop for hitting the cache. So there's actually a kind of cool property that despite the fact that we have like 50 plus pops around the world in front of the platform, if you hit the cache once for a request, then it doesn't matter where else in the world you make that request again, you will hit that same cached copy. Um, so it, um, that also minimizes the, um, like the load on our origin. And that's, that's another right reason why we don't run varnish boxes at the origin because it's already collapsing the requests down and um, intelligently routing them to the po to the point where, if we ran a varnish box, it probably wouldn't improve our cache hit rate overall. Like we wouldn't, like any anything that it would get would probably already be a miss because um, the, if it was going to hit, it was going to hit it fastly anyway. Um, but uh, not every CDN has this. Uh, I think that things like CloudFront may not. Yeah. So does it not make sense to have like a typical Drupal stack, you have Drupal, you have Varnish on top of that, and then the CDN? So does it ever make sense to have the CDN and Varnish at the same time? It depends on the, whether the capabilities of the CDN are sufficient to handle your caching rules. So for a CDN like Varnish, or not for like Fastly, it's so configurable that it's basically inconceivable that there's any kind of rule I could set up in my own copy of Varnish that would ca be able to cache things that I couldn't put as a rule into Fastly. If you're using something like CloudFront, where you might not have something like an origin shield, and your cache rule set might be more limited, then I could imagine why it might have a benefit to have another layer where you have more sophisticated rules. Yes? Does the CDN have edge side includes? It depends on the CDN. Um, Akamai supports edge side includes. Um, Cloudflare's workers can do includes. Um, Fastly can support edge side includes if you enable the feature under certain, uh, and it depends partly on what compression formats you use and whether you're delivering it over an HTTP2 enabled um, uh, IP. But um, in general, the answer for higher end CDNs is yes. Um, the answer for things like, say, CloudFront is probably no. Uh, Akamai is actually the creator of the, the like pseudo ESI spec, and I say pseudo because it's never really been ratified, but it is used in a number of systems. Yes? I have a question about the CS JavaScript. So, the, uh, recently there was usually like Drupal combined all JavaScript and all CSS for this page, and it's usually a huge file. So the size of the header is very big. And we now have to pass the model to be able to select which uh, specific CSS files and JavaScript files to include in the page. But this, in this case, the aggregated file will be different on all pages, so that will increase the amount of like, information that we What do you think is better? 
this this is part of why I'm looking forward to a future where we future where we can turn off the aggregation because at the point where we have things like no aggregation but broadly HTTP three etc then we'll get the best of both worlds which is that uh, paid like any content that the pay, that a browser has seen before will continue to be cached and anything new for the next page that you're on can be pulled down but right now um, you just have to have a trade off like you either have to load more and bigger content in order to provide a better experience on other pages, or um, you have to uh, have smaller and more separate files, but you're probably gonna miss more often on the next pages. Uh, the, I don't think there's any great answer right now until um, we have like more of a future that doesn't require aggregation the way we do. Okay, hey, um, I guess we'll take it to the hallway. <laughs> Thanks.